The Turnaround, by Stephen Lake. Introduction This story was created based on the idea of do unto others what you would have them do unto you, as a parable of sorts that asks, if whatever you did to others was done directly in return to you. How differently would you behave, or treat others? This story will explore that idea, and the potential benefits, as well as consequences, of both one's actions, and an action in such a scenario. So let's now have a look at how that might play out in real life. The Story Todd sat quietly on a park bench in the middle of Philadelphia and studied the people around him. For a place that was called the City of Brotherly Love, its citizens displayed anything but love to one another. He was actually quite surprised at how badly people treated each other here. His heart sank slightly as he watched two men get into a heated verbal argument in front of him. God, I wish there was some way you could make these people be nice to each other, even if only for their own benefit, he thought. What would you have me do, came a kindly voice in his mind. Todd perked up slightly and looked all around him, but saw no one near him. Hello, he said curiously. A small laugh echoed in his mind. I'm here, came the voice again. Todd cocked an eyebrow slightly and then looked around again but still saw nobody near him. All right, seriously, who's there? he asked. Just then a warm, exciting feeling of love washed over him, followed by a kind laugh. You know me, and yet you ask who I am, came the gentle, sweet voice in his mind again. Jesus, he asked cautiously. Yes, came the gentle reply. Todd suddenly grew nervous and immediately bowed his head. Lord, I am honored by your presence. But I am unworthy of such a privilege, he said. Fear not, for you are more than worthy. Now speak your request, and it will be answered. Todd took a deep, anxious breath, and then looked around him. Lord, could you make these people be nice to each other, he asked. Todd felt a brief wave of sadness flow over his heart. I cannot, for I will not intrude upon their free will, came the reply. Todd waved his hands dismissively. I'm, I'm not saying you should force them. But rather, well, could you make it so that they prefer to do good to others, rather than evil? Hmm, came the intrigued, almost bemused reply. How would you have me do that? Well, far be it from me to infer that I'm right in thinking this, but what if you made it so that, when someone tried to hurt someone else, they instead hurt themselves. I mean, if you're going to hurt yourself by trying to hurt someone else, wouldn't that encourage you to be nice to others? Well, I don't mean you specifically, Lord. I'm, you know, just talking from a human perspective here. Jesus laughed. I understand. I was once human myself, he said kindly. Todd blushed slightly. Ah, right, I forgot, he replied sheepishly. Jesus laughed again. Indeed. As for your request, it can be done. However, would you be willing to submit yourself to the same rules as you are asking me to place upon others? Is it not right that you should suffer both joy and sorrow equally as they will? Todd pondered this for several moments. You're right. It would be wrong for me to ask this to be imposed upon others, and yet exclude myself from its enforcement. So yes, I will gladly submit myself to whatever you choose to do to fulfill this request. However, I only desire for this to be done if it will actually change people for the better. If it will not, then I withdraw my request, said Todd. Jesus sighed. Change can only come of a conscious, willful choice. If they do not wish to change, they will not, no matter what they may be asked to do or endure. Each person must make their own decision to either change, or remain as they are. I understand, Lord. Good. Then shall I proceed? Todd thought about this briefly. Yeah, I think it's worth giving it a try. So yes, Lord, please proceed. Jesus smiled then it is done. Suddenly Todd's attention returned to the world around him. 
even though the conversation felt as though it had lasted for several minutes, in reality only a brief few seconds had passed in the world around him. He then focused again on the two men who were arguing. However, nothing appeared to have changed, despite knowing that Jesus had answered his request. But just then, to his complete surprise, spiced with a generous amount of confusion, he saw something unbelievable happen. One of the two men who were arguing took a swing at the other. But instead of the second man receiving the result of the blow, it was the first man's head that snapped around as though he'd been punched by an unseen force. He grabbed at his face and swore profusely. He then looked at the other man, who now stood completely dumbfounded and confused, uncertain as to what had just happened. He then growled angrily and charged the second man, driving a powerful right hook into the other man's face. However, once again his head snapped back, as though punched by an invisible fist. He then staggered back several paces before dropping to one knee as he cupped his face in his hands. More people began turning and looking on in confusion and curiosity as the first man pulled his hands away from his face to reveal a broken, bloody nose. Just then two policemen appeared from nearby and confronted the second man. What did you do to him? asked one of the policemen. I didn't do nothing, man. He did that to himself, protested the man. The policeman's partner walked over to the first man to check on him, but was shoved hard by the man as he tried to stagger to his feet. But, to the policeman's surprise, he felt nothing. Instead, the man was sent flying backwards and crumpled to the ground in a heap. What in the blazes, said the policeman in confusion. The man then got up, stormed over to the now surprised policeman, and kicked him in the shin. Again the policeman felt nothing as the man cried out in agony and grabbed his shin. Todd furrowed his brow at this. Just then a slight shriek caught his attention. He turned and noticed a posh, austere woman walking down the street towards him escorting a poodle. But she wasn't doing it gently. She appeared to be cruelly yanking the dog around on a leash that was far too short for the little animal. However, instead of the dog being hurt by the woman's actions, it was the woman herself who suffered from her own cruelty. Each time she yanked on the leash, it was as though someone had done the same to her. She would then yell out in surprise, turn, and yank on the dog's leash again. This, in turn, resulted in her being yanked backwards in the same way that she'd done to the dog. This was causing her to become increasingly frustrated and angry as well as confused as to who was attacking her, and why all of this was happening. Eventually she kicked the little dog and then screamed in pain as she collapsed to the ground holding her rib cage in agony. The little dog, however, simply sat down on the ground and looked at her owner in confusion. Unsure of why she was laying there moaning and carrying on as though someone had run her over with a truck. Todd cocked an eyebrow slightly at this, and wondered what to make of it all. Just then he felt a twinge of pain in his own ribs. He found this sensation curious, and then noticed that it was in exactly the same place that the lady appeared to be hurting. Then he felt a blow to his shoulder, and one to his hip as though he had fallen to the ground. His eyes grew wider as he quickly realized why he was feeling this. Because he was watching her suffer, and doing nothing to help her, the pain she was feeling was now becoming his own. He immediately leapt to his feet and rushed to her side. Ma'am, are you all right? he said as he knelt down next to her. The lady shook her head. Someone hit me, she groaned. Todd very gently helped her sit up, and then took a quick inventory of her injuries. Thankfully they were only minor bumps and bruises. Where does it hurt? he asked kindly. My ribs mostly but also my shoulder, and hip, she groaned. Todd studied the lady for a little bit, and then looked at her dog. Just then an idea came to him. Ma'am, this might sound silly, but I know how to make you feel better. What? Are you going to give me morphine or something? Todd laughed. No, actually, it's something you can do for yourself. It's very simple really. If you'll be kind to others, you will yourself be blessed. 
but if you do harm to others, you will be hurt in kind. The lady cocked her head to the side and looked at him as if he was nuts. She then looked at her dog and yanked hard on the chain. This caused her to immediately be thrown backwards into the ground. Todd grunted in frustration. Every time you do something bad to someone else, even your dog, it will come back on you. Don't you get it? That yanking sensation you keep feeling, and the pain in your ribs, that's from what you did to your dog. If you'll be nice to it, you'll be blessed in return, he said. The woman scoffed at him, and appeared as though she'd been insulted. She then glared at him with bitter disdain for several moments, and then paused in surprise as she herself felt the same emotional pain as Todd was feeling in reaction to her stern rebuke. She pondered this curiously, and then slowly began to realize what was happening. Curious to determine if what she was seeing was true, she reached over to her little poodle and poked it. She immediately felt the sensation of a gigantic finger poking her in the side in the same way she had done to her dog. But the dog didn't react, save to wag its tail more vigorously. She then leaned over and gently petted the dog. It initially withdrew from her in fear, but then slowly grew happy at the affection being shown to it. This, in turn, made the woman feel happy as well, and made her aches and pains immediately go away. Todd soon helped her to her feet and gently handed her the dog. To his surprise, the woman apologized to him for being so rude, and then excused herself. As she walked away, Todd studied her with concern, but soon knew that she would be all right. After a moment, he turned and noticed an old lady coming towards him. Realizing that she was tired and in pain, he immediately hurried over to her and asked if she needed help. She kindly refused. He then paused and waited as she passed by, curious to see what consequences his inaction would cause. For a while nothing happened. But when she began to stumble slightly, a rush of pain and fatigue washed over him. He immediately hurried to her side and helped her to a nearby bench where she could sit down and rest a while. He then felt loneliness fill his heart. So he sat and talked with her for a while. He could immediately tell that this had lifted her spirits and made her feel better because he now felt better himself. He then briefly turned his attention back to the two arguing men and was surprised to find that the second was now helping the two policemen carry the first man through the park to a waiting. Ambulance not far away. Apparently the first man had succeeded in beating himself up pretty soundly as he tried to lash out at everyone around him. Todd felt a twinge of pity for the man. He would likely continue hurting himself for some time to come before he woke up to the reality of this new world. Todd then turned his attention back to the old lady and talked with her for another twenty minutes before she finally got up and went on her way. Just shortly after leaving, Todd's phone rang. He looked at the display and saw that it was his friend Doug. Hello, he said as he answered the call. Hey, dude, have you heard about what's happening, came Doug's voice in his ear. No, I haven't. I'm still at the park. Oh man, dude, it's wild. All kinds of crazy stuff is going down. Todd laughed. Anything specific of interest, he asked. Actually, yes. Do you remember that greedy old geezer, J.J. Perkins? The one that built hundreds of us out of our pensions? Todd nodded unconsciously as he remembered the man's face very clearly. Yes, I do. I take it something happened to him? Something. Dude, that's putting it lightly. Apparently he's now bankrupt. What, said Todd in surprise. Yeah, totally busted, man. The old fart doesn't have a dime to his name anymore. But that's not the wildest part. I just got a call from the bank that my pension fund is reactivated, and all the money he took from me has been returned. Can you believe that? A slight smile appeared on Todd's face. Actually, I can, he said with a light chuckle. What do you make of it? Well, how about I tell you over lunch? You interested in something to eat? asked Todd. 
dude, seriously? Yes, I'm serious. What would you like to eat? Ah, uh, well, how about some pizza? Todd smiled. Sounds good to me. I'll meet you down at Antonio's in half an hour. Todd looked up as his friend sat down at the table across from him. So, how was the trip down here, he asked. Doug gave him a peculiar look. Oh, man. It's nuts out there. I mean, it's like cats and dogs living together kinda weird. Todd laughed. I can imagine. A lot of strange things happened to me along the way as well. Like what? Todd then spent the next several minutes explaining everything that had happened to him at the park and on his walk to the restaurant. As they continued talking, the waitress walked up with a large dish of pizza, breadsticks, and dipping sauce, and set it in the middle of the table. Doug was surprised to see the toppings on it. Dude, you ordered a pizza just the way I love it. How epic is that, he said excitedly. Todd laughed. Well, it's not hard to remember how you like your pizza. You order the exact same thing every single time. Doug smirked. Dude, of course I do. You never mess with perfection. Todd laughed. Well, dig in. It's on me. Thanks, man. I appreciate it, exclaimed Doug. He then quickly scooped up a piece of pizza, lifted it to his mouth, and seemed to pause. Todd looked at him curiously and wondered what was wrong. He then watched in interest as his friend struggled to get the food into his mouth, but was unable to. Todd then picked up a piece and tried to take a bite as well, but discovered that he also was unable to. It was as though his hand would move only so close to his mouth, and no further, no matter how hard he tried. Confused, he put a single olive on his fork and lifted it to his mouth. But it wouldn't go. So he lifted it over his head and tried to drop it in. It fell a short ways and then seemed to bounce off an invisible barrier in front of his mouth and onto his plate. Doug watched this with interest and then shook his head in disbelief. Dude, that's just wrong in so many ways, he said. Todd studied the fallen olive and thought about this for a bit. Suddenly a thought crossed his mind. He picked up his slice of pizza and held it out to Doug. Open up, he said. What? said Doug in confusion. Open your mouth. What are you going to do? I'm going to feed you. What? Dude, what are you? Trust me, just do it. Doug eyed Todd in confusion for a moment, and then leaned over and took a large, juicy bite out of the slice of pizza. Todd cocked an eyebrow slightly, and then tried to put the slice in his mouth again just as before it wouldn't go. But when he handed it across to his friend, only then could it be eaten, and only if he fed it to him. A smile crept across his face. That's really interesting, he said with intrigue. What do you make of it? This is, like, epic levels of weirdness, you know. It's as if we're suddenly forced to be super nice to everyone, said Doug. Well, it's not so much a case of forced kindness, as it is a literal application of the saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In other words, we're being made to do unto others as we'd have them do to ourselves, and if we don't, we suffer the direct consequences of that. Doug grimaced slightly. That makes you wonder how far this goes. I mean, what am I going to do when I get home and there's nobody there to feed me? Todd pondered this for a bit. I don't think it'll apply there. Only when someone else is involved. So if you're alone, unless it affects someone else negatively, you should be free to do whatever you want. Doug grunted. Huh, that's going to make life interesting. So how long do you think this will last? I don't know. Maybe until we learn to do it instinctively? Doug snorted. Given what the average person is like, that's gonna be a while. There'll probably be a lot of people starving to death before that happens.
Todd laughed. Well, maybe yes, and maybe no. Only time will tell. Yeah, probably. So, you still hungry? I've got half a slice of pizza in my hand and nowhere for it to go. Doug smiled. Sure, dude, I'd be honored to take another bite, he said with regal flair. Todd smirked. Hey, don't get sappy on me. Doug laughed, and then enjoyed the rest of the afternoon with his friend, eating, fellowshipping, sharing, and making the best of this strange new world. Over time everyone gradually adapted to this new way of living, each one instinctively being nice and considerate to others, even if only to avoid harming themselves through their own selfishness. In time people became so used to this new system that very few noticed when things returned to normal. Even so, knowing that this had happened once before, everyone in the world became very mindful of others, and incredibly kind to their neighbors and friends such that. Should this same situation ever happen again, they would not find themselves on the receiving end of their own selfishness once again. The End <laughs>